Hello everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank, thank the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, it is a real pleasure. Um, and so I'm going to make myself small, just to introduce myself. So my name is Alvaro Orsi. I'm a principal scientist at Plantech. Uh, and this talk is about uh, discussing a bit of the role of artificial intelligence in what we call data-driven horticulture. So just a brief outline of this talk. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about myself uh, to understand sort of the, my path uh, till I go to Plantec to work on these topics. And then I'm going to introduce the concept of data-driven horticulture and then discuss a few case studies and and with some actual student uh, projects. Mm -hmm. So I'll start with, with me. Um, so I my background is actually in astrophysics. Uh, I did my PhD in Durham. I finished in 2010. Uh, the subject was in galaxy formation uh, modeling. Uh, so it's a bit like uh, the stuff that I'm showing there on the right, where I was modeling different galaxy populations and understanding how they populate uh, the cosmic web of dark matter and, and that sort of thing. So clearly nothing to do with the kind of things that I'm doing now. Uh, I did postdocs in Chile in the Institute of Astrophysics. I even took a permanent position at uh, an observatory uh, research center in Spain. Um, but in 2019, I moved uh, with my family to New Zealand and I decided that I wanted to try a new career path uh, and the opportunity to get into data science uh, was very interesting and so I did it and that's uh, how I got into Plantech. So I want to say a few words now about uh, Plantech. Um, so Plantech is a research center, a regional research center uh, in New Zealand. It was initially funded uh, by the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment. Um, and essentially it's, uh, it is a research center specifically devoted to bringing artificial intelligence solutions to the horticulture uh, industry. Okay. Um, the Institute is built around a number of shareholder companies uh, that are all companies in the agri tech or horticulture space uh, here in New Zealand. Some of them are CESPRI, Robotic Plus, Eurofins, and so on. There are labs and companies that uh, make uh, different devices or uh, ex main kind of industry uh, wide exporters of, of uh, kiwi fruit, for example, in the case of CESPRI. And one of the nice things of CESPRI. Uh, I'm sorry, one of the nice things of Plantech is that this is a multidisciplinary uh, team, meaning that uh, all of us, all the researchers, come from very different backgrounds. I mean, in my case, I, my background is in astrophysics, but I work alongside people from computer science, people from statistics, people from bioinformatics, uh, people with a robotics uh, background, people from remote sensing and GIS uh, expertise as well. So, so it's a very diverse uh, team, which makes it very interesting and actually very stimulating uh, to work uh, in. Because uh, you, get, you get lots of different uh, points of view, view when you're discussing uh, projects. In terms of the work activities, we do essentially three uh, different work activities. The first one is shareholder projects. And I'm going to discuss uh, some of these later in the in, uh, under case studies. But we also have an internal research strategy where we intend, uh, where we have some uh, specific funding devoted to develop uh, capabilities that can then be transferred directly into the industry. And we also uh, receive funding through externally you know, competitive funded projects as well. Okay. So I'm going to talk about data-driven horticulture now. Um, this is essentially the, uh, the object of study uh, in horticulture. 
and this is a very complex uh, biological system essentially so there are many uh, there's an interplay of many different factors uh, driving you know the growth and the development of, of an orchard right so here is sort of a sort of a summary of what what this is and on one hand you have the environment uh, which means essentially the climate but also uh, the soil the soil properties the soil nutrients soil uh, moisture for example and then by environment we also mean uh, the presence of pest or the presence of, of disease right uh, all, all these factors uh, have an uh, interact with the specific genotype of the crop uh, that under study mm -hmm. and then on top of that you have growers uh, who applying different management practices right in terms of for example irrigation the application of fertilizers uh, or that sort of thing uh, and all of that contributes in the end to a specific phenotype which is essentially what we what we end up measuring right like what's what are the actual properties uh, of the crop that we see what's the uh, what's the size, the biomass, you know, etc. What's the fruit, essentially. And uh, in terms of, uh, for the industry, essentially the, the, the kind of the key uh, aspect that we want to optimize uh, is the productivity. And by productivity here, we mean either uh, the actual yield, as in the number of fruit uh, that, is, that is produced, it could be also uh, the fruit quality, uh, or any other metrics, you know, sometimes even, uh, yeah, could be some, some environmental uh, uh, sustainable uh, targets uh, as well, okay? So, so what is data-driven horticulture and how this concept uh, came about, right? So this slide is essentially just to kind of introduce, or to uh, make uh, aware uh, the fact that uh, the, the, how different technologies uh, or the adoption of different technologies in, in agriculture or horticulture, right? I mean, obviously, the, <laughs> the, the, the field of agriculture is as old as uh, civilization, right? Um, but essentially, since uh, the early 20th century, we are already seeing the first signs of uh, adopting mechanization, uh, through then later the green uh, revolution with first uh, genetic genetically modified uh, crops and that sort of thing uh, in the 80s is when uh, the concept of precision precision agriculture uh, started being uh, applied with which is essentially using uh, sensors uh, to optimize to kind of bringing things to the quantitative uh, level right also, when GIS started playing an important role, essentially mapping uh, mapping crops uh, from from the top, from satellite or from airborne uh, systems, right? Uh, and then much uh, recently, we are seeing the the birth of this data driven uh, horticulture, where now we also have uh, arrays of IoT, Internet of Things uh, devices, essentially networks of things like uh, soil moisture uh, sensors or you know weather stations or you know essentially pretty much anything right uh, yeah, artificial intelligence and computer vision have contributed a lot to uh, the exploitation of imaging uh, technology uh, and automation has also contributed a lot to this concept of high throughput phenotyping which essentially um, means that you can measure uh, properties of cannabis uh, and you can scale out your, your technology to essentially m make this very efficiently right uh, the next uh, the next frontier essentially is to come to the to the concept of digital farming uh, autonomous operations when uh, for example robotics will will be adopted uh, so we, we, we're only seeing the sort of an early adoption of uh, robotics and autonomous systems uh, deployed in orchards, but that is something that uh, is definitely happen happening in, in the next uh, few years, okay? Um, so this is sort of another example of how these things uh, look like nowadays, uh, where we have each one of these icons here represent a different uh, 
a different sensor or a different data collection platform, essentially. Okay, so all these uh, data sources essentially are contributing to to create uh, some sort of summary uh, summary dashboard like uh, kind of control uh, device that uh, then an, uh, an agro expert, you know, like an agronomer or, or a knowledgeable grower can then uh, use to make uh, informed decisions, right? Uh, so that, that, I guess, is in a way what, what people call smart monitoring uh, nowadays, right? What's the role of AI in, in all of this is that now we can uh, leverage uh, quantitative approach towards uh, not just not just presenting the data uh, to the expert, but actually being able to recommend uh, decisions. So, uh, so now uh, AI is actually able to optimize the decision making process and tailor specific actions that could eventually even be uh, automated uh, as well. Right. So this is where uh, the horticulture industry and the adoption of technology should be uh, moving uh, towards. Okay, um, I'm gonna move myself again. This is um, a bit of a summary of or, of some of the different technologies uh, and data collection platforms that we at Plantec uh, use for for our research, uh, and that they are available for in in agriculture and and horticulture. Uh, space. So on one hand you have remote sensing platforms and remote sensing means essentially that you're measuring uh, that the object that you're measuring is is just far uh, from the sensor, right? So what this means in practice is that you use an UAV, essentially a drone, to take images or to take uh, LiDAR point clouds or you use an, uh, an aircraft uh, where you mount a uh, uh, a camera sensor, for example, or even uh, you use satellite uh, satellite data. Okay, so from from all these platforms, what you're getting essentially is a view of the vegetative uh, canopy uh, from above, right? But then you can also collect uh, data uh, kind of from the canopy itself. Uh, sometimes this is called proximal sensing because uh, you're actually uh, touching the, the object uh, where you want to get the data from, or you're essentially very, very close uh, to it, right? So you can, do, so you can also image uh, the canopies, in this case, uh, from, from underneath, for example, in, the, in, in this example. Um, it's interesting that, uh, as I'm going to discuss in a moment, uh, the problem of horticulture doesn't end uh, with the orchard, because there's a whole, that's just half of the of the problem, if you like, the other half is to understand everything that happens post harvest, essentially when the fruit is stored uh, and placed eventually in containers, and it's, it's going to be shipped to uh, different countries, and you know, etc. So there's a lot of information that you can gather, essentially. Uh, and as I said before, machine learning, uh, deep learning, computer vision, AI in general. Are the tools that we use nowadays um, to essentially to make uh, management de uh, decisions that are that have a quantitative foundation uh, essentially right um, this is another example that is perhaps uh, more focused in, in remote sensing uh, specifically because the interesting thing here is that you have um, depending on the data platform that you're using, you may have uh, very different spatial uh, resolutions uh, available, right? So you can sample uh, you can sample fruit, for example, uh, with, with proximal sensing devices, right? Like you can take an image uh, of of the fruit uh, in the orchard, right? You can also study individual plants. Uh, you can also study uh, things at the bay level, like for example, a row uh, in an orchard. You can study a full block, a full orchard. Uh, you can go all the way up to the regional level, right? Especially with satellite uh, data, for example. Interestingly, all these technologies also have their own 
temporal uh, resolution that are very different as well, right? And they can be very irregular. Uh, so satellite imaging is a good example of that, right? When you never know whether you're gonna, gonna have the good climatic conditions to to actually use the, the data that comes from, from the satellites, right? Um, so these are kind of interesting opportunities, but also um, very difficult challenges sometimes uh, in terms of integrating data from, you know, that, that is very disparate, right? And as I said before, um, things that happen uh, in the orchard are actually just half of the story if uh, you want to understand something like the fruit quality that arrives, you know, at, this, at, a, at the supermarket uh, in, in, in another country, uh, for example, right? And this is because the, this part of the supply chain, so the storage and the transportation, etc., there are just so many, so many different factors uh, that play an important role here that uh, it's, very it, it, it's very little understood, you know, and there's still a lot of research into trying to optimize uh, this type of process. And of course, that's an opportunity for, again, for machine learning and AI technologies to, to play a big role. Interestingly, um, the horticulture industry or uh, especially here in New Zealand, uh, it plays such a big role in, in the economy, you know, that uh, not even a global pandemic uh, managed to slow it down, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, Cespri in this case, which is the main marketer of kiwi fruit uh, here in New Zealand, um, the main, main exporter, uh, really, um, just continue uh, shipping uh, fruit throughout uh, 2020 and uh, same during 2021 and actually um, and actually the industry grew uh, during during these uh, years of, of pandemic mm -hmm. so now I'm going to discuss a few case studies the first one uh, this is done with uh, with collaboration with one of our shareholders so that's Cespri as I was saying the cure uh, marketer and and they have a program that they call digital crop estimation in which uh, they they have these baggies uh, that are shown there that can travel uh, from underneath the canopy and they have uh, some they actually have three cameras that are pointing upwards and the idea is that these cameras are taking these images uh, that i'm showing there uh, so the challenge is to being able to estimate uh, first what's the what's the fruit count uh, in the orchard right uh, and, and secondly, what's the size distribution of the fruit uh, in, in the orchard, okay? And the reason why this is important to do before harvesting takes place is that uh, for Cespri it's actually key to have an accurate crop estimation because this allows them to uh, essentially to, oops, sorry, this allows them to prepare all the logistics uh, for the for the rest of the supply chain, and to accurately uh, accurately plan for the for the number of containers for the uh, relative fraction of uh, fruit that will be traveling uh, that will be shipped to to different countries, for example, and having an accurate uh, estimate of these numbers uh, can actually it actually turns into millions of dollars uh, of of, uh, of savings, right? So, so it's a very important it's a, it's a very important exercise. Mm -hmm. So, how do we actually uh, solve this problem? Well, the technical solution is first a combination of uh, deep learning AI to identify individual fruits. So, this is a problem of uh, object detection and then segmentation of, of the fruit. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, over there is, is just showing an, ex an example of this. And then, in, in, in a second stage, using the segmented fruit um, to engineer algorithms that can estimate the weight of the fruit. Because in the end, that, that's the quantity uh, that is relevant for the industry, right? So obviously, you can't guess, you can't estimate the weight from the fruit just by, just by looking at an image like that. What we really do is to, we estimate the size of it, uh, and then we can convert uh, the size 
to the weight using already known uh, you know, uh, scalings. Okay, but one key uh, one key step into getting the accurate sizes is to actually know what's the height of the fruit with respect to the cameras, right? Um, because obviously all you're getting from the images are just 2D projected, projected uh, images of the fruit, right? So the fact that we have a buggy that is traveling and is taking uh, multiple images means that uh, over consecutive images we are, uh, we are actually looking at the same fruit from different angles, right? So this allows us to do triangulation, right? To estimate, uh, you know, the real height. So if you know how long, how, what was the distance between consecutive images, and if you're able to detect exactly the same fruit from two consecutive images, uh, you can you can essentially do this and and, and get a good estimate of the height. Uh, this sounds easy in practice, but it brings uh, its own set of uh, challenges, right? In making sure that you can actually uh, detect the same fruit in consecutive images, and, and then the fruit is an extended object, so you actually want to focus on a specific point uh, in the fruit, right? To get the triangulation right, and you also, uh, when you're counting, you also don't want to, uh, because you because you have you are repeating uh, the same uh, same fruit over uh, over multiple images you don't want to count uh, the same fruit more, uh, twice, right? So the whole thing, although sounds very simple, uh, in the end it becomes uh, an extremely complex uh, problem to solve. Now, um, this project, as I said before, they had a very specific, uh, a very specific need, I mean, it's answering a very specific need for the industry, but uh, there are also, you know, it's got many different uh, applications uh, right that we can we can exploit this technology for a lot more right uh, so for example we can monitor now we can monitor the growth uh, of the fruit over time we can combine this uh, we can combine these maps of counts and sizes with aerial imaging essentially to understand what's the relationship between uh, the foliage properties and the properties of the fruit underneath right uh, so you can look at the spatial distribution of fruits, uh, canopy density, uh, etc. Teflon changes, the, the yield, and, and so on. Right? So now let me uh, move on to a different uh, case study. This is related to what I said before about this second half, uh, essentially, of the, um, of the supply chain uh, of kiwi fruit in this case. So the fruit goes through three main stages. First, what we call pre-transit or static storage. Uh, sometimes it's essentially when the fruit is harvested, it goes to a pack house where uh, it's labeled and graded and put into trays and eventually into pallets and stored in a cool store facility uh, where they essentially keep the fruit cold until it's ready to be uh, shipped, right? So that's the transit uh, period when the fruit is put into a container vessel or a container or, or a charter vessel and it's sent you know to Japan to Europe to whatever uh, and so there there are a lot lots of different uh, lots of different attributes in, in that sense and finally when it arrives in in this market it's put into storage again until eventually uh, a fraction of the fruit is uh, tested uh, so there's a fruit quality assessment there and so the challenge of this project was to understand the role of temperature control uh, in in driving the outcomes of the fruit quality assessments that are done uh, in the in in the different markets right and that's quite tricky so this is an example of the temperature profiles of a, for a given pallet or a given kiwi fruit pallet from static storage all the way to transit and and more and we can get this data because what they do essentially they they have uh, a number of pallets up, are also placed with with a temperature logger so we can see how the temperature in that pallet evolved through time and you can see that th these temperatures are, are very complex even in some something like static storage as you can see you you would Im 
you would expect the fruit just to remain cool here, but actually it suffers a lot, lots of different variations that are given by different cool store operations. During transit, things are also very messy. And so it is, I mean, it, it's, it makes sense to, to wonder if any of these things are having an impact on the quality of the fruit uh, that arrives in, in markets, right? So it's a highly, uh, from, from, a point of, from the data point of view, it's a highly dimension, uh, it's a problem of highly dimensional uh, complexity, if you like, in the sense that uh, you have just so many attributes of this uh, cool chain and you have the temperature histories at the same time that it's really difficult to just uh, pinpoint, you know, what, what are the factors that influence uh, fruit quality, you know. So one of the one of the ways to address this is to study this with from a dimensionality reduction perspective. So here we're using UMAP, is one of these uh, uh, modern dimensionality reduction techniques, um, which essentially groups things. Uh, so each point here corresponds to a palette, uh, and there are about fifty different properties uh, per palette. And here, just by coloring by the sort of the time within the season, whether it's early in the season or late in the season or by mid season, we can see that just the time when the fruit was packed mm -hmm, uh, is already playing a huge role in terms of determining the properties uh, of that of that fruit, right? And we can say that because essentially the, the colors uh, are grouped by similarity. But obviously, you can see, g given the complexity of the of these points that I'm showing there, there's obviously there are many other factors also playing an important role, right? So, and one of the questions here is how do we explore or how do we uh, make the best possible use out of these complicated temperature histories? So it's a problem of time series uh, analysis, essentially, right? Uh, one interesting thing that we found is that we could uh, use autoencoders to encode information that comes, you know, from hundreds of timestamps uh, or even thousands in some point, in some case, down to just a five-element uh, vector, essentially, which is in the bottleneck layer. Uh, and I'm going to show you how, you know, doing this extreme data compression, essentially, once if you compare the original data, which here is in blue with the decoded uh, data using the using the decoded part of the autoencoder, um, you get roughly, uh, you, you can recover reasonably well, you know, the shape of the temperature histories. Mm -hmm. And these are, these are some examples. You can see that in some cases it works really well, like here on the, on the top left, right? In others, it doesn't work very well, but, but it's still reasonably well that it's still encoding uh, the information you know, uh, reasonably, reasonably well. And so these allow us to use the, this five element uh, vector essentially as independent features uh, to predict fruit quality and also to do other things, you know, like to, to see whether there are patterns, uh, kind of non-trivial patterns in the, in the temperature histories, right? And this is an example, you know, that if you focus on the transit period and you use the encoder, the encoded, uh, points, then you can actually, uh, and you run a clustering algorithm over that, you can see uh, that you find uh, different groups in, in the data. And actually, when you start looking at these uh, temperature histories of these different groups, you, you, you start seeing differences. So, so, it's, so it's a quite interesting uh, approach. On a more practical side, we can uh, predict fruit quality outcomes, uh, just building uh, classification models, for example, to determine whether the fruit quality outcomes were positive or not. And, you know, the, 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 the industry doesn't really care if you're, <laughs> doesn't really care about the performance of your algorithm or that, that, that sort of data science uh, uh, kind of specifics of, of, the, of the algorithms you use, but they really want to know, uh, they want to understand why you're getting particular uh, fruit quality outcomes, right? And so this is an example of using uh, feature importance uh, analysis to understand what are the main features that are driving a particular fruit quality outcome. 
And in this case, we see that, for example, the, the market, the week when it was packed, you know, the median temperature, uh, and that sort of thing uh, is having kind of is kind of use, having a big chunk of the of the importance uh, of the models, right? So I'm going to uh, finish by discussing also some student projects, and this comes from uh, essentially uh, two different collaborations that we have uh, had with uh, Durham University students from both from their uh, some uh, master's program and from the CDT uh, in the form of a placement. Um, so let me show you, essentially both, both of these projects uh, aim at understanding something that is very important, which is called plant stress, right? Uh, plant stress essentially is anything that is contributing to uh, plants underperforming, right? Uh, for example, by underperforming, actually, we, we can say that this is uh, related to, for example, their photosyn photosynthesis being uh, inefficient, for example, right? Uh, so, so, what can cause uh, this kind of plant stress? Well, it could be water uh, drought or excess of water, so water extremes, extremes of temperature, uh, soil conditions, nu nutrient, uh, lack of nutrient or overabundance of nutrients. So all of those are kind of abiotic uh, stress uh, sources. There are also biotic stress uh, sources like uh, pests and disease, uh, even the presence of weeds. So that's sort of the the goal uh, of of uh, some of these projects, because um, this is a very important piece of information for the industry, because it can drive uh, a specific response in terms of or uh, orchard management practices to. Uh, to address a uh, plant stress, right? Um, so how do we how do we actually measure this? So we we've actually recently been awarded uh, a project where we're trying to put together uh, many different data collection platforms uh, together. Um, one of them is, for example, the, the the digital crop estimation that I was uh, mentioning before to do. Uh, to understand, uh, to do fruit counts and fruit sizing. Uh, another one is, is an airborne hyperspectral imaging uh, sensor, um, which I'm going to discuss in a second. There are also pro uh, proximal or close range devices to understand uh, the properties, uh, for example, the spectral properties or the, you know, uh, the abundance of uh, specific micronutrients or, or macronutrients at the leaf level, and also UAVs uh, also to perform, in this case, LiDAR point clouds. Uh, so here I'm going to discuss uh, projects that are related with these two uh, platforms, with both drones and hyperspectral imaging. In, by hyperspectral imaging, uh, by the way, here I'm referring, I'm gonna move, my, oops, I'm gonna move myself, in a second. Hyperspectral imaging, uh, so sort of, to introduce it, I think it's better to talk first about RGB. So RGB is sort of the standard imaging technique where you have three wave uh, wave band or three channels, essentially red, green, and blue. And so here, in this in this plot, we're just showing those three points, and this is a wavelength, right? Then there's another technique called multispectral imaging, where we have not three but actually perhaps tens or dozens of, of different uh, channels, uh, wave bands. Uh, this is uh, typical of some satellite imaging uh, and other, uh, other sensors that sometimes um, are put in, in drones, okay? So you see that now with, with all this information, you can now start understanding very well the different, uh, sort of the, the spectral response of the objects that you're studying over a much, with a, with a lot more detail. And hyperspectral imaging is what uh, essentially creates a data cube so that each one of your pixels uh, now contains a full spectrum uh, of, the, of, the, of, of, of the object that is being recorded there, right? So um, for astrophysicists, this is, this is very similar to what, for example, uh, instruments like Muse, right, are, are doing. Uh, but in this case, it, this is a slightly different technique. But, it, but the data product is the same, right? It's a data cube. And here you can see now that you, we can trace with 
a lot more accuracy the specific uh, spectral response, for example, of a veget veget vegetation canopy, right? So that, that's hyperspectral imaging. Uh, and now, um, with one of these projects, what we were really interested was in measuring um, the, oops, sorry, measuring the response of um, orchards to photosynthetic activity, essentially, right? So to measure photosynthetic activity, what we really want to do is to measure what, what we call sun-induced fluorescence. So fluorescence is um, so when, when, when plants absorb uh, sunlight, mm -hmm, a fraction of that sunlight is used in, in the photochemistry process, essentially in, 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 the, in the carbon capture uh, and so on. But there is a lot of, red, of energy that is absorbed, but that is not utilized by the plant uh, for photosynthesis. And this excess of energy must be released, right? And most of it is released in the form of heat, and that's why plants emit a lot in the infrared. But there's another fraction of this radiation that is emitted uh, by in, in the form of fluorescence. And fluorescence, uh, the interesting thing is that it has, it has a very specific uh, spectral signature. As you can see, it has two peaks at around 680 nanometers and 740 uh, nanometers. Uh -huh that are related with the uh, specific uh, capacity of the different photosystems uh, in, in plants. Um, and so the idea here is to understand, to being able to measure this and understand uh, how can we trans uh, convert these measurements of fluorescence into photosynthetic efficiency, right? So kind of the, kind of the uh, at first order idea is that when plants produce or emit a lot of fluorescence, it means that they are not utilizing their absorbed energy for photosynthesis very well, right? So the, the, the higher the fluorescence measurement, uh, the higher the stress, essentially, of the plants. It is a lot more complicated than that, but that's kind of a first uh, approximation. And this is uh, an example of how we can study or how we can model, essentially, this. So this is a ready-to-transfer model uh, that is done over a simulated uh, avocado or orchard, essentially nine avocado trees. And here, uh, for example, in, in the top right is showing the radiation that is absorbed for photosynthesis. And essentially the interesting here, thing here to, to see is the sort of the, the different variability, right, that is given only by the structure of the canopy, mm -hmm. then uh, this creates uh, different temperature gradients uh, across the, the leaves, right? And then here in, on the bottom, we see the net photosynthetic absorption, essentially the carbon uptake, uh, which also varies uh, for, for different plants, right? Um, so let me, let me show you. So essentially this is uh, work that we did with uh, James uh, Wallace, a master's student, and he was able to use uh, these uh, e this uh, the data from the uh, from the hyper uh, from a from hyperspectral imaging of keyboard food orchards that were taking uh, uh, yeah that were taking uh, th this year during uh, during this year's season uh, and he was able to infer to essentially extract the fluorescence signal from it now this is extremely difficult because uh, the fluorescent signal is usually only a few percent of the spectral of the canopy spectral uh, response uh, that you typically see, right? So it requires us understanding uh, and being able to calibrate our models uh, very well to to being able to to do that. But the the kind of the end result is shown here. So these heat maps are showing uh, sun induced fluorescence. So the dark areas are areas of high fluorescence. Um, yes, and so essentially, what what this is saying is that those regions of high of, of high fluorescence may might be might be indicating the presence of stress, right? Uh, so there is still more work to 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 be done in order to really uh, get to that point. But if we, we if we are able to to robustly say that these are uh, regions of stress, 
then we can look uh, into different man uh, management practices that might be able to ca capture uh, what is the source of that uh, stress and essentially uh, being able to uh, address it, right? That's, that's the idea. Then with, an, with another student, uh, this is uh, another work that we did as part of a placement with a CDD uh, student from Durham. So this is uh, Omar Ruiz Macias. He, what he did was uh, understanding, uh, trying to do canopy reconstruction mm -hmm, uh, from LiDAR point clouds. So this is an example of a kiwi fruit, uh, of a, a kiwi fruit orchard, but uh, this is how, the, how a point cloud uh, looks like uh, from a kiwi fruit orchard. So this is uh, a LiDAR sensor uh, that essentially takes, uh, sends a beam uh, from, a, from a UAV. Um, and this and this and then uh, the it's it's able to construct essentially to three make a three D map uh, by 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 measuring these these points essentially right um, so then the question is once you have this three this three D point cloud map how can you how can you retrieve the structural properties uh, of the canopy right um, one problem with with doing that is that uh, um, collecting ground truth, essentially kind of exact uh, solutions that you can compare against your your point cloud measurements. It's really hard and sometimes really expensive. So instead of doing that, uh, with um, what we did with Omar was to create a simulation. Mm -hmm. So we used a a uh, we used a graphics. Uh, a 3D graphics uh, software, uh, in this case Blender, and we pop we created a virtual scene of trees, and we used a LiDAR uh, simulation as well, which is uh, shown there in the animation. And so essentially the sensor is, is doing a funny wiggly uh, navigation path over this uh, simulated scene, but that's just for illustration. And it's creating this point cloud as it passes through, right? So then the, the main question here is how how can you retrieve uh, the structural properties of this of these trees for, from that point cloud, right? So that involves essentially four uh, different steps. The first one is tree segmentation. So this is being able to uh, distinguish individual trees and Sec uh, and do, do segmentation, essentially uh, identifying the, the trunk structure and the branches and separate uh, the points that belong to the leaves from those that belong to branches. So essentially the algorithms typically look for cylindrical structures. Mm -hmm. um, so that's branch reconstruction. And once you have that, and once you have the point cloud that is associated to the leaves, uh, then we can try to understand what's the leaf angle distribution, because that's uh, it's going to have a big impact. As I was showing before with the radiative transfer model, uh, the, the distribution of, of leaf angles is going to have a huge impact on the on the on the spectral properties of your canopy, right? And finally, we can also measure the leaf a area density. Mm -hmm. And here, because we have a simulated scene, we can oops, sorry, we can compare uh, the exact uh, or true result with what we can estimate from the point cloud, right? So this is still work uh, in, in, in progress, uh, I would say, but, but you can see that uh, it's actually very promising and we're getting, we're getting really good results, right? Um, so finally, what, what's sort of, the, sort of the ultimate goal of, of these of this projects is to being able to create a, a virtual orchard. Essentially a virtual orchard uh, or a digital twin is a, a digital laboratory uh, where we can, you know, that is built uh, it's exactly the same structural uh, and biochemical properties of a real orchard, but where we can now test the impact of different uh, management practices, you know, for example, like the pruning or the impact of, uh, you know, the impact of, for example, uh, different irrigation uh, practices or and so on. And we can also test... Uh, the response or the, the, the growth or development of, of our digital orchard and how it responds to different environmental 
conditions, right? We can use, for example, uh, climatic forecasting models and see how, how water will develop, right? So the sort of the main idea here is that we can optimize uh, both economical and also environmental targets, right? Like uh, towards environmental sustainability. So if you can optimize the use of fertilizers, for example, if you can optimize the use of irrigation, then you're also uh, contributing uh, to having uh, orchards that are highly productive, but also uh, environmentally sustainable, right? Which is becoming more and more important uh, nowadays, okay? So I'm just gonna leave you with this, uh, with this uh, video. Uh, and that's, uh, that's my talk. Okay, thank you very much for listening. Bye.